the dead, the dead help the yeah, answer? Very much. Thank you. Okay. Yes. Yes. Um, I'm involved in a Buddhism that has chanting in a really a, a rhythmic fashion, but I know some people have meditation practices that are silent. Do uh, you feel like there's an important distinction between one or the other, silent meditation versus uh, practices that have chanting? To me, all the practices, personally, do it just depends on your personality and what works for you. Some people like silence because they too much noise creates disturbance and they need to be silent around nobody and, and so they can so everything can just begin to calm itself down. Some people like rhythm and through the rhythm they go into a state of that same silence. You know. So now I can say this, I can't say other people aren't like this, but I know most black people like rhythm. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And so you, you know, you get into that rhythm, you know. And, and, and I know the kind of chanting you're doing, so it got that funk thing on it that, that I call it. You know what I'm saying? You get into a thing, and this is what Herbie was talking about, when you get into that thing, and it puts you into a state of no mind. So when you hear that music, the music, but that doesn't mean other people don't experience that, but I'm only just saying I know from our culture, you know, when you get, you know, because really funk music ain't nothing but mantra. But you get on, you get on like James Brown or Funkadelic, you get on that groove like that, and there's nothing but just doing that same mantra over and over. That really didn't take place in, in the white community until ISKCON came here. Mm -hmm. ISKCON was the first major movement where it said white people is okay to jump and dance and jump around. <laughs> <laughs> that I saw. That I saw. I mean, I know there, there are holiness churches and different churches mm -hmm. and where people danced up before on a mass level where it's okay for you to let loose and, and do your thing. But and it was it was fertile at that time because of, of the movement, you know, I like to use the word hippies, but you know, the hippie movement, the, 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 the uh, people uh, being in communes and working in groups. So when Prophet came here, that was, that was a fertile ground. All he had to do was say, chant and be happy. You know, so they went, you went from the psychedelic music to the Maha Mantra. You already had people in collective. So that particular system don't even work unless it's a group process. It's real difficult to do that practice like looking at a computer. Mm -hmm. Where Buddhism is, and this is my opinion, Buddhism is taking more of a, a, a forefront in today's world because everyone is so disjointed. Mm -hmm. So you can go on, 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 on YouTube and, and look at, or listen to a lama give you a teaching, you can be by yourself, practice by yourself. You don't have to be around a lot of people. You can't practice this kind of, you don't get the same effect with this kind of practicing by yourself like that. The whole group effect is what makes that work. And plus they have food and the facade and the whole thing. So that's how that works. <laughs> you know, you know, actually Elvis was the first guy that actually got up and started moving around like that. And then from Elvis it became, uh, if you remember that, then next thing it became, it became the, um, uh, the, the Christian movement. As far as it's, it's okay, because there were laws in this country that you couldn't dance in the street. How many people remember that? There's still townships. I mean, there's a Ferndale, Michigan, which is right outside Detroit. They just got rid of the ordinance, ordinance that you can't dance for the clubs against the law, dance for the clubs. I know, because I played reggae in the club, and everybody had to sit, sit like this. <laughs> and the police would stand out there waiting to see if someone danced, so they'd give them a ticket. Yeah, so there are towns that they have the old old laws on the books that was against the law to dance in public. Yeah. Man, expressing yourself. Now that's not the case. People are dancing and you have drum circles and people doing this and that. But it wasn't always like that. Not, and I came in on the tail end of it when things were, you know, you were a child of the, of, of the 50s, of, of that baby boom. You came in on the, uh, on the midpoint between and during the 60s, the, the change of the old ways going into new ways. So you got a chance to see both things. You know, so um, now it's like America's come a long ways. And America's a great place because, let me say this, there's no place in the world where you can, I can go over here to a Buddhist temple and then I can walk down the street to a Vedic temple and then I can walk across the street to a Baptist church and I can go over here to a Sufi practice all within a one mile radius. I go eat Jamaican food, Indian food, Thai food, Indian food, soul food, any type of culture all within one radius. 
So it's like, it almost seems like a new thing is getting ready to come out of all this. Like me, me and Bridget talked about that. It's like a new, mm -hmm. there's a new, a new thing is getting ready to come out of all these old or traditional systems that are all coming to one pot. It's almost like a new food is getting ready to be made. All these ingredients because really we're in special times. And people in ancient times had to travel miles to go to another culture to see what was going on. It might took them a year or so to travel from one part of the world to the next. But now we have everything at our fingertips. And if you really just want to know something, you have that computer and you have to hit Google and it all comes up. <laughs> or most of it comes up. You know? So there's a, there's a new reality, in my opinion, that's getting ready to happen. There's a new way of thinking. There's going to be uh, a part of all these old ways. So I, I'm not saying the old ways are not important, and I'm not saying the old traditions are not important, but there's something that's akin to us here in America that's different than any of those old ways can address. Even though it might take some of the elements of those old ways, but a new way has to come about because everything is living. So if you keep following the old ways, you find something that's dead. So I use a music concept, a musician, one of my teachers said, you know, well, classical music is dead. I said, what do you mean it's dead? Because it's on a sheet, and you don't know what Beethoven or Chopin and they were thinking about when they wrote this. You got to look at this sheet and try to figure out. So Glenn, the late Glenn Gould and all these different um, persons, with Glenn Gould would spend like six months studying one piece of music, trying to bring the life out of it. something on a piece of paper. You don't know what Chopin was thinking about. But... The music that's living is the music that we hear right now. So we read this, these various texts. In Buddhism, we say sutras. We read them. We study them. But you don't know, in reality, you do not know what they were thinking about. A lot of stuff that, that Sakya Muni wrote wasn't even written down and put together until like 100 years or 200 years after he had passed away. You don't know exactly what he's thinking about or the cause and conditions or the situations in which he said it. You rely on what somebody else is telling you. It sounds good, but that might not be it. We have enough time trying to understand what we say in front of each other. <laughs> yeah. All right, we talk to each other. What did you say? I don't understand. You say that. All right. Yet, people will kill one another over something that they said somebody said 5,000 years ago. It doesn't make sense. I mean, you weren't even there. And plus, the language was different. Yeah. That's right. The whole worldview was different. So there's a new thing, in my personal opinion, that's going to come out of America. As much as we complain about America and its ways and what it's done, and that's the way of Sansar, there's a new wave of, of, of conscious people all over, like all of us sitting here, and people wherever they are, you know, that and many of us have studied and looked at a lot of different systems. Um, and out of that, Something new is going to happen, and that's just my personal view on that. Yes, ma'am. Um, you might have partially just answered my question with what you just said, but um, with your personal teaching and your background, what does your Buddha, Buddha, Buddhism says regarding all the issues um, that Black people and you other people of color um, experiencing from police brutality? Poverty, yeah, my own words, outright war against black folks. Well, I can tell you what I have to say about it. Okay, I can't tell you what the Carmichael would say because I've never known anybody to ask him that question. Mm -hmm. So, or anybody else in the traditional line, but this is what I would say about it from my understanding. The main thing is that as long as you, this is a martial art concept too. As long as you keep feeding in and reacting to what somebody does, you, 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 you become enslaved to that whole vibration. So the first thing that has to happen is we have to get into what I call the concept consciousness beyond color. We have to begin to look at things clearly. I look at things clearly. I, the way I look at things is when, the, the, when TV put all that stuff about police and stuff, doing all that kind of stuff, they do that on purpose. This is my feeling, to incite people emotionally. I happened to be a police chaplain for eight years, and um, as a chaplain, I was able to see things in the back of a police car that kind of gave me a different view. It supported many views I had, 
but also gave me a different view of things that I thought was a certain way and weren't a certain way. And one thing I can say is that as long as you keep people operating out of the first three, you know about chakras, right? Mm -hmm. That emotional chakra and those animal chakras, there's always going to be a problem. So the first thing to do is ignore and to get your mindset not to feed into all the stuff about police. That's A. Secondly, be the best person that you can be and reach the highest state of what you can be. And, and we have to begin to look at things from a truthful point of view. Like for example, I used to ride a bicycle when I first came to uh, Gainesville. So I'm riding down the street, white police are there, this young guy with his pants all the way past, down past his ankles, is calling the police all kinds of MS and, you know, everything, but the police want to see his driver's license. And I kind of knew if I wasn't there, that the situation might have been different. So the first thing I said, and I'm not going to tell you how I said it, mm -hmm. I told him, give, give the people what they want because they're trying to do their job. All they want to do is see your, your driver's license. That's all they ask for. All you're doing here is setting yourself up to get hurt. So the first thing is, as black people, since you said that, we have to make sure that everything we're doing, A, is correct. That we follow the laws and act in, in, in a certain type of manner. I know for a fact in the music business, and then I'm going to answer more of your questions. The music business, I know it was, I might use the word conspiracy, but I know that the hip hop thing came out purposely to send us back in uh, 50 years. You know, I met Russell Simmons. I said, as close to Russell Simmons as I've said to you. And I ain't going to tell you what he said. He's a Buddhist now, so I ain't going to say nothing. I ain't going to say what he said at that time. You know, it was a conspiracy. Gym shoes with no laces on them. That whole prison look, that whole prison mentality. First hip hop was like fun and everything, but they systematically set that thing up so that you got 70% of the people that in prisons today, 80% of the people in prison today are black males and Hispanics. America's a fifth of the world's population, but houses 25 to 30% of the prison population. You see? But where were the people, so called, saviors and messiahs in the black community where they were playing all this negative hip hop. Sent telling people like doing Dr. King's days, we're not gonna listen to the radio station no more if you don't take this kind of music off. You see, because music influences our people a whole lot. That's why I talk about that, because I know a lot of our young folks and people influenced by the images of, 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 of sports figures and, and um, hip hop artists now, or musicians in general. And I know it was systematically set up like that. I know that, this is not no guesswork. I remember George told me, and Boosie told me, he said, man, they don't want no funk no more. They took, they took our master tapes and sent it back to us. They want this kind of thing to happen now. I went to record company, they said, look, don't put no positive lyrics in your music. They said, if you can put negative lyrics in your music, we assign you. Your music is good, but change the lyrics. I've had A and R people right tell me tell me that, so I know it's true. It's not uh, something that I'm, I'm thinking about, and I've seen the effects of it. Unemployment. Booker T. Washington. You know he is, right? Mm -hmm. Booker T. Washington. You need a trade and a profession. Most young folks today can't cook. They can't make clothes. They can't do nothing for themselves. They don't even exercise no more. This is the kind of thing I think we need to do first. We don't read. We don't study. This is what we have to do. Create our own jobs. Make your own. When I came up, like in the 60s, we made our own blue jeans. The girls made the blue jeans we paid them for. <laughs> you know. So you keep money circulating in your own community. It's a simple thing. That's what everybody does. You know? And getting rid of the persecution complex that white people are doing these things to us, but white people are not, never did do these things to us, and aren't doing these things to us. Rich people did these things to us, because only rich people could buy slaves. White people couldn't buy slaves. Rich people bought slaves. Okay? Rich people bought slaves. White people didn't buy slaves. And another fact, 
6,000 blacks in this country own slaves. That's looking at things in the clear vispassion, looking at things that they really are. So we got to get up this, this whole mentality about slavery and all that. Oh, slavery was a business. It's like drugs. So if you know a guy on the street selling drugs, he's just, he's just as dangerous as the slave trade. Drugs is the new slave trade. And as we sit here right now, we got human trafficking going on everywhere. And everybody's in it. Everybody was in slavery at that time. Arab traders were in it. Africans sold their own people into it. Europeans had boats and brought the people over here. Native Americans had slaves. Blacks owned slaves and whites owned slaves. That's the truth because people wanted free work for not having to pay somebody. If you had the money, you could buy a slave. Now that's the truth, but most people don't want to hear that. But from a Buddhist point of view, from clarity, that's how I look at it. From a Buddhist point of view, I know that a lot of these things that they, they put on TV about police doing stuff, inciting people, is to create division among people, to create old, higher feelings among people, to create racial divide among people. Because if you keep people divided, you can control them. This started in 1880. That's how the Ku Klux Klan got started. Because after Reconstruction, the slaves that were free and the masses of working whites came together. The government became afraid. There was a guy named Albert Pike. His, his um, statue's up there in Washington, D.C. He started the Ku Klux Klan. So we're going to create a division. The reason why you can't get no job is because these black folks are there. So if the black folks weren't here, you would have a job that created, that, that started that whole thing. So we have to look at things clearly. But it's hard to get rid of those imprints. I know. I get called from Detroit. The police did this. I have to be like, well, I got to go. I don't, want, I don't want that stuff to come up. You know what I'm saying? I mean, look, police, when I was growing up, and I grew up in a middle class neighborhood, a gumpy kid, I experienced the police throwing me on the ground, putting guns up to my head. You know where, where, where I live, my, oh, yeah, yeah, we spoke on Detroit. You know, I had the police throw me on the ground because they were looking for Hayward Brown and them. You remember that? They were looking for three black guys. Any black male over 5'10, the police, they had something called the Big Four on stress. And I had guns put up to my head and my mouth and everything else. Cocked. Coming home from school. But I had to get past all that. I only just mentioned it to you now just because of the subject matter, but it's not nothing I really think about. You know. So that's what I think we have to do. I think we have to get out of that color syndrome and that persecution syndrome and white people are doing these things to us and these people are doing things because these people are not doing it. White people are suffering just as much as black people. But white people on the mass are just as ignorant as black people are. They don't know what's going on. They, only, they, 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 they fed a certain amount of information, and we fed a certain amount of information. Now I'm going to say something, you got to cut that off. <laughs> yeah, I, I'll do it later. <laughs> I know for a fact that the Nation of Islam and the Ku Klux Klan used to meet twice a year to formulate their strategies. I know this for a fact. And a lot of these other separatist groups on the white side and the black side, they're being funded by one source to keep people divided, to create all this kind of stuff. That, that um, O.J. Simpson thing, that's what that was about. I was a police chaplain at the time of O.J. Simpson. I saw a police report on those, like the lieutenant showed it to me. It's nothing about what they told you. All that stuff they told you, it, was, it wasn't that at all. That was a hit. O.J. Simpson couldn't have done that. I couldn't have done it. The way those bodies were set up, those were experts that killed those people. But they wanted to create a division in this country at that time because there was too much intermingling between sect of the races at that time, between whites and blacks. And that O.J. Simpson thing created a divide. That was one reason why. But they didn't stop nothing because you had more intermingling between people of various cultures than you've ever had before. And not just white and black, but of all different. And then let me say this too. If your ancestors came here before 1900, it's guaranteed you got black and Indian blood in. Now maybe if your people came through Ellis Island, that might not be the truth. That might not be the case. 
made. But if you have your ancestors go back before 1900, most likely you got Native American blood, or what we call Indian, and you have some black blood in you, whether you're black or white. Read before the Mayflower by um, Lerone Bennett, where they talk about they forced intermingling between Irish and blacks. There's so much intermingling, and the, the mind is in the blood. So it's really no pure races that exist on this planet anyway. We got the blood and the mindset of every race that exists. It's just because our outer complexion looks a certain way. Is it how we judge people? And that can change from generation to generation. Yes? I, I've been pointing out to some kids. I've got, got the opportunity to teach a few times at Lincoln Middle School this month called the Black History Month. But I point out to them what we call race. It's one tenth of one percent of the genetics mm -hmm. that counts for the differences in complexion, the shape of the nose, mm -hmm. lips, and eyes. All that is raincoats and sunglasses. We've <laughs> 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 been fighting over for right. so long, but it's one human family. In fact, in the in the taxonomy of biologically naming yeah. living things, two different races cannot produce offspring. Mm -hmm. So the whole thing right. is a misconception. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, so it's one of the biggest um, hoaxes, and, um, they, they, you know, they put the people, but as long as we operate and we have certain types of, um, like fear, and we have low self-esteem within ourselves, it's easy to project that off ourselves onto somebody else and say that the reason why I'm in this state is because these people are responsible for it, or they are responsible. You know. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, um, I heard you were talking about, yeah, you, know, you had the opportunity to, to study different mm -hmm. philosophy. Um, I just want anybody who's interested to know that um, that we do have we have a discussion meeting next Friday in Nietzsche and Buddhism if anybody's interested in. And I'll have the address and give you, you know, time. Because uh, we have a nice, actually a wonderful group right here, which I didn't know, but until, um, so, you know, few years ago, um, studying Nietzsche and Buddhism. So, if anybody's interested, in this, I'll you next Friday, right here in the evening. Yes, sir. Um, I was just interested in, on your second image from the left, uh, it has a picture of Buddha in the middle. What is the significance of the details around Buddha? What is, what are you trying to show? These are uh, uh, various Buddhas that are uh, probably his teachers and what have you, but I can't tell you who they are, okay? You know, specifically I can't tell you that. But they're all the he is mostly in other Buddhas, though? Yes. Okay. yes. Any other questions, comments, concerns? Yeah. No, you have anything. All right. Um, is there a, a practice group that you meet with that the students meet Yeah, we meet at the. Uh, that's in Trolling, which is on 9th uh, Avenue Northwest. Does anybody have a flyer? I think I do, yeah. Okay. Can have yeah so the conference that's in Trolling Temple, most of our uh, meetings are on uh, Sunday. Sunday morning, 9 o'clock, we have um, 9 o'clock, we have meditation, shower talk, um, and then we have basic teachings at uh, 10. We have book readings at 11, and we do our what we call Chen Rizzi compassion practice and Amitabha practice at uh, uh, 12 o'clock. Oh. And then um, and on Tuesday and Thursday, we have yoga there from 5.15 to 5.45. Mm -hmm. um, I teach a G Kong class on Tuesday from 7.30 to 9.30. Mm -hmm. And we have a more in-depth study like Buddhist College, where we study right now, we study Mahayana tradition. And um, that's on, um, uh, on Thursday at 6 o'clock. Then we have a China, uh, our Asian group, primarily Chinese, come in on Friday mm -hmm. at 7 to 9, and they do their practices in Chinese. You're all welcome to come at any time. Mm -hmm. All welcome. And um, if you just want to come up for me at the address, you can get that address and what have you. And um, I have been to your meetings, too, and they're very nice. Mm -hmm. This room meetings I've been here. Can yeah. anybody come do the Qigong? Come anybody can come. Anybody can come. Mm -hmm. All really welcome. Close to here. Yeah, really? Oh, good. Any other comments or concerns or questions? Did, was this information helpful to you in any means? It's excellent. Thank you so much. We should do it again.
<laughs> so I can bring my friends. <laughs> All right, I'll, I'll try to do it again. Um, I'll definitely try to do this. Um, we also have uh, our, our center uh, sponsors the movie night at the uh, CMC, uh, Civic Media Center, every second Monday at 7 o'clock. We're showing a film on um, Buddhism, different types of Buddhism or subjects. Our next film will be uh, actually a more commercial film, The Seven Years in Tibet with Brad Pitt. Mm -hmm. So that will be the second Monday of March, and our flyers will be coming out. And also tonight, every third um, Sunday at 6 o'clock, we have Bowling Bodhisattva, so I had to split Bowling um, Alley at 6 o'clock. <laughs> so you're welcome to come out and bowl with us, okay? Um, Stay, okay. And thank you very much, I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.